Hi, I'm Maya Nowens, WIWS Senior Fellow for Chinese Defense Policy and Military Modernization and host of the WIWS Sound Strategic Podcast. In today's episode, I'll be speaking to some of the team behind the WIWS Armed Conflict Survey, an annual report exploring the political, military, and humanitarian impacts of active armed conflicts around the world, which will be launched at the WIWS Manama Dialogue on the 18th of November and live-streamed globally this year's review is complemented by strategic analysis of the national, regional, and global drivers of conflict, as well as conflict outlooks, providing unique insights into the geopolitical and geoeconomic threads linking conflicts around the world, as well as into emerging flashpoints and political risks. Today, we'll take a look at three topics explored in this year's book, from the nexus between climate change and conflict, to the re-emergence of protracted conflict, and the growing importance of geopolitical factors in the current global landscape. We'll also explore the WIWS's Armed Conflict Global Relevance Indicators, which benchmarks the global relevance of armed conflicts across their geopolitical impact, as well as human impact and intensity, and what the team have learned from applying it in this year's Armed Conflict Survey. To discuss these important topics, I'm joined today by Dr. Irene Mia, editor of the Armed Conflict Survey and Senior Fellow for Latin America and Conflict Security and Development, Dr. Benjamin Petrini, Research Fellow for Conflict Security and Development, Juan Pablo Medina Biquel, Research Analyst for Conflict Security and Development in Latin America, and last but not least, Erika Pepe, Senior Coordinator for Research and Research Analyst for Conflict Security and Development. Welcome to the show, Irene, Benjamin, Juan, and Erika. Irene, for our listeners who aren't familiar with the Armed Conflict Survey, can you give a quick 101 to our listeners on what's new in this year's book and what the book will tell them? Thanks, Maya. Yes, the Armed Conflict Survey series is one of the annual flagship publications of the WSS and also of the Conflict Security and Development Program, where we all work. The series has been monitoring and trying to make sense of the global conflict landscape since 2015 with the aim really to provide our audience of expert practitioner and policymaker with a strategic assessment of domestic, regional and global conflict drivers, as well as of current developments and future trends, including political risk and flashpoints of conflict. For the team on the podcast today and myself, this is our second report. And once again, putting it together has been quite a journey. Our review period from March 1st, 2021 to April 30, uh, 2022 coincided with a very tumultuous period of the war. Not only we witnessed the dramatic development in Afghanistan in the summer of 2021, the Russia invasion of Ukraine in February this year, but also we have seen how the two shocks of the coronavirus pandemic and also the Ukraine war have intersected with a long-standing and accelerating climate emergency to create an unprecedented food insecurity crisis worldwide. This is going to have important implications on conflict and instability trends going forward. Therefore, the world really appears as a much more fragile and less secure place today. And in the report, what we have tried to do really is to provide insight on the current and future drivers of instability, as well as possible glimpses of hope and solution. In terms of what is new in this year's report, starting from the coverage of the report, uh, we have included a, a chapter on Haiti, given the marked political and security de degeneration after the assassination of the president in uh, last year in July. We have also made some adjustments on how we treat conflict in sub-Saharan Africa, extending the regional unit of analysis to all the conflict in the region in, a, in an effort to better capture the increasing internationalization of conflict in the continent. What we also have done is insert a number of regional essays in an effort to connect dots across conflict, covering trends of strategic importance for the region, from the escalation trends in the Middle East, geopolitical dimension of conflict in sub-Saharan Africa, to the regional repercussion of the Russia-Ukraine war in Eurasia, to the geopolitics of fentanyl in the Americas, and the intervention of China in Asia conflict. So really we try to look at strategic trends, not just at the global level, but also at the, at the regional level. The report this year includes a special features on climate security, given the increased urgency to understand the complex interlinkages between climate change, climate vulnerability and conflict amid accelerating global warming, and also the increasing role climate change plays in global stability and security. The report, in that sense, delves into three important aspects of the climate conflict nexus, which we selected for their strategic importance in shaping the conflict landscape at the internal, but as well as the geopolitical level. So we look at issues like the nexus between peace building and climate resilience, and the 
the need to align the two agenda in a joint way for best results. We also look at the instrumentalization of uh, natural resources by non-state armed group as a tool for military and political leverage during war and its aftermath. And also we look at the more geopolitical angle, so looking at the geopolitical and geostrategic implication of the energy transition, including in terms of geostrategic competition for critical minerals and emerging flashpoints. I mean, that's fascinating, and you have a wealth of information in the publication, but what would you say are the main trends that you're seeing in the current conflict landscape that you have drawn out from your research over the past year? That's a very hard question to answer in a couple of minutes, but I will try my best. I would say the first trend that comes to to mind is the growing complexity of the global conflict landscape in terms of drivers, actors, and dynamics and also the related instructability challenge for most ongoing conflicts. One important source of complexity is the increasing internationalization of armed conflict across the world. While most ongoing wars at the moment are internal in their essence, a growing number and range of powers have been intervening more and more in pursuit of their strategic interests in those internal conflicts. This further complicates internal dynamics, of course, which already have sometimes a transnational character and also a host of different drivers. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February this year escalated the ongoing trends of geopolitical competition to a whole new level, with profound implication and repercussion on great power competition and also geopolitical alignment, as well as the sustainability of the current rule-based international system. The war has had a lot of important consequences for the global uh, conflict landscape. One was that it seems to have marked an inflection point in a recent trends of intervention fatigue and lack of strategic clarity we had seen from the West, right? The case of Afghanistan was, uh, has been a, a case in point. Fatigue that actually in the first place had opened the place, uh, it, it, it opened the way for a larger role of middle powers, including Russia, in conflict and peacemaking process. By threatening security in Europe, the Russia-Ukraine war in a way strengthened the West cohesion, as it was apparent in the adoption of, of sweeping economic sanctions but also triggered a continental strategic reassessment uh, and a process of rearmament in, by NATO and many European countries. Such trend will likely have implication on the outlook for many ongoing civil wars, of course, which we cannot probably uh, yet uh, assess completely. Another reason for the global significance of the war is its multiplier effect on drivers of conflict globally. By intensifying pre-existing food insecurity and inflation trends, uh, it is creating it will create even more fertile ground for instability and social upheaval. At the same time, the unprecedented humanitarian crisis and reconstruction needs created by the war will limit also international humanitarian aid and development funding available for other conflicts and other crises in the world. Finally, always looking at the strengths of geopolitical competition, uh, what we have seen is that uh, global, the global energy transition and also climate change mitigation strategy are going to become increasingly a kernel of geopolitical competition going forward. Disagreements over mitigation responsibility, uh, coupled with competition over control of green transition critical resources, uh, will likely become increasingly important sources of interstate tension and also exacerbate current geopolitical divides. Control of green transition critical minerals will increasingly drive third party intervention in civil war in resources rich, fragile countries, but also will become a key consideration in non state armed group calculation. As I mentioned, also the regional essay shed light on strategic regional trends, which will shape conflict in a different part of the world. But I will let Benjamin and, and Juan expand on those. No, indeed. And, and it's interesting to draw out these three big themes of climate, COVID and conflict across the board in combination with geopolitical developments that you've looked at in your book. And maybe to just narrow down into one of those to speak with Erika next about her research in the book on climate change and the nexus of climate change and conflict. Erica, you've developed a framework to better understand the nexus between climate change and conflict, natural resources as well. Can you give a quick burst as to what you've developed and what that shows us? Thanks, Maya. In the Am Conflict Survey 2022, we've been exploring different aspects of the climate conflict nexus. And one of the chapters that Irene and I co-authored, we look at the dynamics of instrumentalization of natural resources in conflict in the context of climate change, also considering the increasing pressure on the availability, quality and accessibility of natural resources, such as fertile land and water, 
And what we've seen it is that this provides increasing opportunities for conflict parties to use these resources as a tool for military and political leverage in armed conflicts. And so you could argue, why does it matter? We believe that this trend is particularly alarming in the context of internal conflicts, for example, also considering that 70% of internal conflicts affected countries that we analyzed are highly exposed to a combination of population growth, water risk and food risk. And of course, uh, this also has been aggravated by the war in Ukraine. But also this form of instrumentalization is also particularly concerning because of a growing number of non-state armed groups use natural resources as part of their strategies for violence, but also for political leverage. If you consider that between 60 million and 80 million people live under the quasi-state governance of non-state armed groups, of course, this matters. And so we created a framework to unpack the different forms of instrumentalization of natural resources in the context of climate change. And what is new in our framework are three elements. First, we took into consideration the proliferation of different conflict actors, such non-state armed groups. Second, we've gone beyond the active conflict phase of conflicts. We've been looking at what we call the continuums of conflict. It is basically before and the aftermath of armed conflicts. And third, we looked at the main motivation behind our resource instrumentalization. And so with this in mind, we created two main clusters of uh, instrumentalization of natural resources. One is what we described as military weaponization. So this is the case when natural resources are exploited as target or weapon during an active conflict uh, to secure strategic goals or for tactical purposes, for example. And then uh, there is a second cluster that we identified uh, as political weaponization that refers to when natural resources are instrumentalized for political leverage or to reinforce legitimacy with local population. And this can be observed in the instability phases that could precede armed conflicts, but also in the aftermath, and could also include positive elements, for example, the protection of specific natural resources to incentivize the support uh, from local population. We have several examples of this phenomenon in the book, and the framework that we created has been proved useful to try to identify priorities for action and to explore solutions. Absolutely. And let's go into that. I mean, what responses from policymakers and the international community have you found during and following your research? This is a very complex phenomenon. It has strategic and security implications for policymakers and international community in general. There are many challenges that prevent this form of instrumentalization to happen, and this is because of limitation in the existing international regulatory framework, but also shortcomings on applicability, compliance, and enforcement of international rules. Despite this, though, what we have seen it is that in recent years, there have been encouraging developments, both in terms of regulation on this matter, but also in terms of engagement with non-state armed groups. We believe that there is a greater attention now also in the UN system to address the, in general the environmental impacts of armed conflicts. In addition to monitor and developing early warning systems for natural resource scarcity, everything that's been put in place in this regard, there's also been developments in the creation of international humanitarian law principles to try and prevent conflict parties from weaponizing natural resources and this, of course, defied the vetoes in the Security Council. Some of these new rules also apply specifically to non-state parties. There is always an implementation challenge, but on the other hand, there have been multiple uh, initiatives by non-governmental organizations to engage with non-state armed groups, uh, build accountability in the areas of their influence. For example, trying to find common ground uh, between uh, the doctrines of non-state armed groups and international legal principles through the signing of commitments, for example, on uh, environmental protection, food security, and many other subjects. Uh, Also, what we argued is that the states can play a part. If you just consider that Internal conflicts are often internationalized, that that we've seen intervention and involvement of third-party states. So we believe that this also can be a way to put additional pressure on, say, armed groups to comply with international legal framework, for example. 
there is an open question on the willingness of governments and international organizations to engage with some of the non-state armed groups uh, that are politically problematic, let's say. This question remains something to be addressed in the context of conflict-affected countries, where the state is not the main actor that deals with the protection of a degraded environment. And so we're working for this. Just to broaden the lens a little bit further then, you mentioned the internationalization of conflict and greater third party involvement in conflict. And I wanted to turn to Benjamin next to talk a little bit more about that geopolitical entanglement. So we've thought in the past about certain conflicts being driven by local dynamics on the ground, but has conflict also become more geopolitical and especially in Africa, perhaps? I think this is a key trend uh, and a key theme on the analysis of armed conflict uh, today. And it is something that is a key theme in the upcoming armed conflict survey. The geopolitical competition, the theme of the day, the war in Ukraine and the geopolitical competition between China and the US, how is that uh, being reflected into armed conflicts? How is that having an effect on internal armed conflicts? So we know, obviously, looking back, uh, we look at the Cold War, right? And in the Cold War, we had this lens that we would look at civil wars as as being proxy wars. The Soviet Union would support one party, the U.S. would support uh, another party, and and the conflict would sort of be stuck and and be very difficult to solve. The end of the Cold War and the the, the first decade, uh, decade and a half after the Cold War, we had this phase in which where there was a, a blossoming conflict resolution at the international level. Now we have come back to this phase that we can define again as proxy wars, but I think it's a bit more complex. It's obviously different. It has different actors. We don't have a bipolar system. We have different actors. We have uh, middle powers, uh, regional middle powers uh, intervening in conflict. What do we mean by intervening in conflict? We mean that there are civil wars, and there are civil wars where there is an external intervener that militarily intervenes in support of one party or the other. So let me just give you some numbers, because those are are always uh, uh, sort of indicative of trends. Let's take uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Between 1991 and 2010, so for two decades, decades, there were 12 internationalized internal conflicts, so these civil wars with an external party intervention, 12 of them. In the following 11 years, between 2011 and 2021, we had 27 of them. Now, the trend is completely reversed. While before civil wars accounted for the most of conflicts and civil wars with external intervention were much fewer, the trend is completely reversed. In Africa, we had eight civil wars and we have 17 civil wars with external intervention. But this is not an issue that it's only about Sub-Saharan Africa. This involves also the Middle East and and, and North Africa, the civil wars in in Yemen, uh, the regional war in in Syria that has so many different uh, aspects, and, and, and Libya. Who are these uh, these interveners? There are the usual big powers. Uh, there is uh, there is the U.S. Uh, there is Russia. Uh, there is uh, increasingly there is also China, even though not intervening directly uh, militarily. And there are increasingly middle powers in the Middle East and in Gulf countries: Saudi Arabia, uh, the United Arab Emirates. But we have also what are called in on the continent on on Africa uh, security providers. Like Rwanda is uh, making a role for itself as intervening in support of government for stabilization, and it has done so in Mozambique or in the CAR, uh, in the Central African Republic. And those are really astounding numbers for a non-expert like myself. Can I just bring in Juan quickly? Benjamin talked about the fact that this expands beyond Africa, but as well that there are examples in the Middle East. Can we also apply the same geopolitical lens to conflict in Latin America, for example? Thank you, Maya. That's, that's a great question. Latin America is a region that for many decades have been sort of overlooked in the international landscape of security and like, let's say global threats. Violence has been in a way contained in the region. As Benjamin mentioned in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, non-state art groups uh, linked with other groups, uh, even in other regions or significant military intervention by third countries. Latin America hasn't had that. 
This because of the nature of violence in the region, which is a mixture of gray zone between political violence and criminality. Recently, we've started seeing a problem which is related to the main source of instability in the region, which is drug trafficking. From a geopolitical standpoint, the attention from the world, especially the West, has been concentrated on counter-narcotic efforts, as the U.S., for example, is the largest consumer of cocaine uh, in the world. For example, illegal drugs are produced and trafficked across the region, mainly Colombia, then smuggled up uh, through Central America and, and Mexico, finally, to the U.S. As a result, we've seen security agreements between the U.S. and the regional countries. We have Plan Merida which was a security agreement between Mexico and the U.S. to dissolve TTOs and crack down on supply chains. We've also seen Plan Colombia to fight the production of cocaine and terrorist threats. Both plans are worth millions of dollars. That said, the consumption of drugs has increased over time and the market itself has also changed. Recent changes in the type of drugs that are more interconnected to globalization and that leads to your question. Today, the biggest problem, as I said, is counter-narcotics, and we have one in particular, one type of drug, which is increasing and is the synthetic opioids. In this group of drugs, we have fentanyl. This is a highly powerful lethal drug, which is 50 times stronger than heroin and is consumed in microdoses. Just to give you a little bit of context, in 2021, the U.S. registered a record high of over 100,000 deaths, and nearly two-thirds of these correspond to synthetic opioids. In turn, the U.S. has uh, declared this a uh, drug overdose epidemic, had started to see how the violence landscape in Latin America is claiming more attention to its own security and instability domestically. In terms of this year's ACS edition, we wanted to bring this into our regional essay. And let me say three important things to consider from a geopolitical angle. The first one is a triad that includes Mexico, the US, and China. We said before, fentanyl analogs, precursors, and pre-precursors are mostly produced in China, which positions this country at the center of the conversation. The U.S. has been trying to prevent illegal production of synthetic opioids, mostly by scheduling the substances needed for their production. In 2019, after long diplomatic pressure from the U.S., China finally scheduled all types of fentanyl-like substances. But this was unfortunately short-lived. Traffickers rapidly switched to producing fentanyl in Mexico, how by importing precursors, pre-precursors not yet controlled, from China. This highlights the ability of Mexican drug traffickers to adapt to supply changes, to new regulations, but more importantly, it also highlights the need for continued fluid cooperation and conversation among countries. During the reporting period of the ACS, there wasn't any significant improvement in the conversations between China and the U.S. in this issue. More importantly, after the visit of Speaker Pelosi to Taiwan in August this year, it was reported that cooperation between Beijing and Washington in certain key issues was frozen, including counter-narcotics. And finally, in this triad, we have also to speak about Mexico. In here, we have a very incipient cooperation, if we can say, between Mexico and China. And this obviously increases the challenges for further regulation. We have to note that China has denied any responsibility on the repercussions that fentanyl production has for Mexico's local domestic stability. The second thing that I would like to mention that was also covered in our essay is that opioids and fentanyl are changing the security agreements across the Americas, especially between Mexico and the U.S. We saw, for example, that Plan Merida was updated to a new framework for cooperation, which is the Bicentennial Framework for Security that happened in October 2021. Now the cooperation is focusing even more for uh, fentanyl and other synthetic opioids. This trend of new conversations and putting fentanyl on the table between the two countries is reflected, for example, in the call that Biden and Andres Manuel Obrador held a couple of days ago, where fentanyl again was a very big topic.
the last point of this instability and geopolitical analysis in the region is that if the U.S. continues to focus its interest in fentanyl and other synthetic drugs, this can have important repercussions for the U.S. regional counter-narcotic policies, especially cocaine. And this specifically can have knock-on effects on other countries very important for the security landscape in the region, such as Colombia and Brazil. Overall, I think that in the case for Latin America, we don't have interventions in the type of military or peace operations like it happens in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. But the connection between the security aspect in the region with other countries is definitely increasing and calling for new actions for cooperation. That's fascinating, Juan. Thank you very much. To turn back to Benjamin, you mentioned before that we had a period of conflict resolution that was blooming, where conflict resolution was successful. Have we returned back to an era of conflict that is intractable? And what does the book tell us about that? Yes, I think that this is a key area that not only the Armed Conflict Survey, but our whole program is really uh, based on, on the understanding of how conflicts and armed conflicts have become more protracted. And what do we mean by protracted? So protracted means they are longer in length, they last longer, but not only that, there are more actors intervening in these conflicts, as I said earlier. There are more non-state armed groups and actors that complexify conflicts. When we look at the conflict trends um, in the last decade, we see that conflicts have increased exponentially and have skyrocketed since 2018. The number of conflicts in 2021 doubled the number of 2011. So what happened in this decade? In this decade, we had the Arab Spring, we had the rise of the Islamic State, we had Russia uh, doing like more power projection in different parts of the world, and we had, uh, let's say, a weaker uh, global leadership and global appetite for, for conflict resolution. Um, in multilateral institutions and in multilateral fora, we can for sure say that. In 2020, we recorded the highest number of armed conflicts since World War II, basically since this type of like analysis and accounting for conflicts. So we are really in a period of peak of armed conflicts, and we need to understand what underpins those uh, trends. As I said earlier, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and North Africa are the most uh, conflict-prone regions where so many of these, of these dynamics are displayed. I think we have three types of different armed conflicts uh, today. And, and looking at these, these three types that often overlap and have, have they're, they're, not, they're not clear cut, there are gray areas, one can sort of look at where the conflict landscape is and how protractedness and intractability plays a role in this. We have regional wars and interstate conflicts. That's the first category that I would say. Um, obvious example is uh, Russia-Ukraine, regional wars in, in the Sahel, and in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Syria is uh, for sure, has obviously a domestic, uh, uh, but it's also a regional war. We have conflicts and civil wars over the political settlement and uh, identity-based conflicts, like the one in Ethiopia, in Myanmar, in Afghanistan, Sudan as well. And then we have all those like messy and fragmented uh, insurgencies and, and, and conflicts where non-state actors are not necessarily uh, seeking central power where there are transnational and local dynamics. Uh, and in here we have uh, many of the conflicts in the Sahel, we have uh, Mozambique, we have Central African Republic. So the landscape is very fragmented. It's difficult to identify opportunities for, for conflict re resolution. So protractedness has really um, different, uh, different dimensions. And what have the responses been to this protractiveness of conflict? I think that that's the heart of the matter here, and and it's all uh, all the this this research that we do. We, we we hope and we want to have a sort of policy implications and understanding what what is the landscape of interventions. And when we say interventions, we say it's sort of like this broad category that includes uh, post-conflict reconstruction, includes counterterrorism, includes uh, uh, peacekeeping uh, and stabilization initiatives, and includes also uh, development 
development uh, approaches in fragile and conflict affected areas. I think that one ticket here that we need to check uh, is uh, all of these, uh, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of gray areas between a lot of these types of interventions. And the result is uh, that if we have an intervention, uh, let's say, and I keep making examples in Africa, but Afghanistan also would, would be an example like that. Uh, if we have interventions that are trying to reconstruct a country and do post-conflict reconstruction and stabilization and, and, and development, but at the same time, we have an objective of uh, uh, fighting terrorists and fighting terrorism, we conflate agendas where the end goal is uh, either unreachable because you're trying to turn a country that, that would not turn peaceful and stable and prosperous in a matter of, of in, in, in the short term, and that we are making a disservice to our own country's interests. We can sort of label the lack of strategic clarity by uh, some of the Western actors are at the root of the problem. France's intervention in the Sahel, the US's intervention and 20-year and, and history in Afghanistan, they share this lack of strategic clarity. And so the conclusion from all of this is that the tools of interventions today are inadequate. Tools of conflict resolution and tools of responding and addressing armed conflicts. Thank you, Benjamin. That's really interesting. There will be lots of food for thought coming out of your work and in, in, in the book this year. Juan, if I could move back to you to turn the focus to another new area of work in this year's ACS. The conflict security and development team that you're all part of have been busy creating a new indicator to measure the global relevance of conflicts. Why was creating this new tool needed? And, and can you quickly explain what this new tool is? This is the second year that we have our Armed Conflict Global Relevance Indicator, or AGRI, as we call it. Here at IIAAs, our research is fact-based and data-driven, and based on that, we wanted to provide an indicator that can help us capture the relevance of all the 33 conflicts in a standardized manner, but also to complement the comprehensive qualitative analysis that the ACS is known for. In terms of the nature of the indicator, this is very useful. And for example, as Benjamin just mentioned, we need tools. And this tool helps assess and benchmark the global significance of conflicts across the world. We understand that the impact of each conflict is multidimensional and responds to different dynamics and specificities. Nonetheless, it doesn't mean that we cannot try to standardize a global analysis. This is very useful for our audience, for example. By benchmarking conflicts, it's easier to identify uh, flashpoints on a global scale or track changes over time for a specific conflict. For policymakers, defense officials and governments, or even humanitarian actors, we believe that this tool helps prioritize actions or even interventions. This indicator has three pillars or dimensions that allow us to expand the different implications of each conflict on a global scale. How can readers find the indicator results? They are featured in each conflict report in something that we call the key conflict statistics box. We also have a global chart that comes with the book where we feature pillars as well for each country. Excellent. And what have been some of the most interesting findings that have come out of the application of this framework? An interesting takeaway is that the three pillars of our indicator do not always as strongly correlate as one would intuitively say. Let me explain why. We have three pillars, as I said before. These are human impact, violent incidents, and geopolitical impact. The first is a composite indicator referring to refugees, internally displaced persons, and fatalities. The second refers to the number of violent events. And the third is a composite indicator referring to military deployments and involvement by third-party countries, peace-related operations, and UN Security Council resolutions. So now, looking at our results, the human impact pillar and violent incidents have a high positive correlation, as expected, I would say. But then, if we compare the geopolitical impact pillar with either of the other two pillars, 
it is challenging to assert a significant correlation. And of these two, geopolitical impact and violent incidents show little, if any, a correlation. This is perhaps the most important insight that I can say. My take on this is that actions of international actors are heavily constrained by political interests and not just by the sole manifestation of violence in the countries that we analyze. So this interesting result also opens the window for the research, of course. And this is in fact something that we hear in the conflict, security and development program are very interested in unraveling, trying to understand the geopolitical dynamics of armed conflicts and the involvement of international actors. That's really interesting, Juan. Thank you so much for highlighting some of those findings. And it's interesting to note this use of indicators throughout the book as well that our audience is going to be able to access both in visual form as well as, of course, throughout the book. Thanks again, Irene, Benjamin, Erica, and Juan for joining me today and sharing some of the details of your impressive work over the past year. And thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Don't forget that you'll be able to tune into the Armed Conflict Survey launch on 18 November via the WISS live stream. So keep an eye out for it on the WISS website. And also don't forget to follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic on wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts to keep up to date with all the latest episodes. For more in-depth analysis of the key international security and defense issues from around the world, be sure to follow the IISS on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit the IISS website. Thank you and see you next time.